session on osteoporosis. Now we'll move on to the next uh, interesting session, which is on Sjogren's syndrome. Uh, the theme is futuristic approach to Sjogren's syndrome. For this, I would like to invite the chairpersons, Dr. Jayakantan from Chandigarh and Dr. Ramnathan Porkori from Chennai. Pediatric Biochemistry Unit, Department of Pediatric Medicine, PGI-MEA, Chandigarh. Dr. Porkoni as a consultant rheumatologist at Dr. Kamakshi Memorial Hospital, Chennai. I would like to invite Dr. Kavita Morasandaram from Chennai to speak on Sjogren's Syndrome, Grand Dawn. Examination, it was a left parotid swelling. Apart from the left parotid swelling, we were also able to notice a left submandibular gland. There was no supraglandular uh, nodes in this patient. The arthritis was symmetrical polyarthritis type, similar to the pattern of rheumatoid arthritis. With basic investigations, this rheumatoid factor was elevated, and CCB was negative. ESR was markedly elevated in the range of 110, CRP was 45, and all these viral markers were negative. So, uh, actual presentation to us was for arthritis. So with history, was there Sika, uh, there was no Sika in this patient in history. So as part of workup, like in view of arthritis with a parotid swelling, though unilateral, we also proceeded with a autoimmune workup in this patient. We uh, simultaneously did a shimmer's test along with an ultrasound of the men also, I mean ultrasound of the parotid glands. So shimmer's test, uh, it was borderline, it wasn't low, as low as less than 5, but right side it had 7 millimeter and uh, left side was 8 millimeter as per ACR Yola, it has to be less than 5 to call it as a pointing grade. So, ultrasound parotid showed hypoechoclesion in the parotid. As far uh, as far as the radiologist were concerned, it was probable the pleomorphic adenoma. So, but when it came to us, a white pleomorphic adenoma was not a possibility here. It was uh, the percentage that it involves a submandibular gland was very low, like it is only 8 percentage and uh, but also the ultrasound did not confirm with a, a possible diagnosis of a Sjogren's and uh, the Sjogren's uh, uh, picture is as such given here, it is usually a inhomogeneous texture if the parietal gland swelling was because of a Sjogren's syndrome. So uh, we proceeded on with the salivary gland biopsy, minor salivary gland biopsy, well biopsy. So this showed periapital lymphocytic infiltration and there was also a focus score of more than 1. So our ANA panel showed a speckled pattern, a fine speckled one. So in the uh, 1640 in dilution and ANA profile confirmed so row 52 as well as row 60. So as far as our diagnosis of Sjogren's is confirmed in this patient because we had a minor salivary gland in the biopsy which showed a focus score of almost 2. So um, anti-SSA positivity was there. Together with 3 plus 3, we have a score of 6. So we did not do an ocular staining score. A shimmer cyst was not less than 5 mm. And by, I mean, uh, we do not normally do unstimulated salivary flow in our setup. So other major investigations from a rheumatological side was, I mean, simultaneously surgical side uh, uh, things were going on. But yeah, from the rheumatologist's per perspective, I also did a compliment. C3 was no, C4, uh, C3 was normal, C4 was slightly low. Cryoglobin assay, qualitative was positive, but uh, immunofixation was not done to categorize whether it is type 1, type 2 or type 3. And uh, 
uh, viral markers again was negative and uh, total proteins uh, were elevated. We had a slight AG reversal ratio but I did not go ahead and do immunoglobulin G, A, M and separate the values as such. So with a parotid and subventricular gland swelling with an arthritis in rheumatology generally we think of Sjogren's, sarcoid, IgG correlated disease also but of course the dominant arthritis of the presentation usually rules out the IgG correlated disease and also it could still be a malignancy with the paraneoplastic arthritis and some infections like HRV and HCV can be also a cause. But in this case as we go about Sjogren's syndrome is a confirmed diagnosis that we have done a lip biopsy and an anti SSA is positive. Sarcoidosis with the X-rays was normal. There was no, not much of an highlight or a mediastinal radiopathy. I did for clearance. I did not actually do because uh, uh, we had a confirmatory diagnosis and also arthritis, uh, dominant arthritis is not a part of it. So, with a problem that the ultrasound did not definitely show us a Sjogren's type of imaging and it was also unilateral, which was not usually a part of a Sjogren's syndrome. We went ahead and did a PET scan. So which showed there is a submandibular uh, uptake. Actually the submandibular gland is a submandibular node there. It was a, there was an uptake. There was uptake in the spleen, parietic nodes as also in the infradiaphragmatic region. So it was like a, a, the pet diagnosis was a suspected lymphoma. Uh, it's stage 5, 4 as such. So we did the submandibular uh, node was done um, and when I, we did a biopsy in that which showed diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. So effacement of the tumor tissue architecture by a diffuse infiltration of large atypical cells uh, which was also confirmed by immunohistochemistry. So the diagnosis which we add was Sjogren's non-Hodgkin's lymphoma and the arthritis which we think is a probable paraneoplastic arthritis. So the questions we had was uh, most of us would have come across Sjogren's syndrome but we would never had seen the NHA as a first presenting manifestation of a Sjogren's. So why the delay in the diagnosis of Sjogren's syndrome was present? The arthritis here is uh, due to Sjogren's or paraneoplastic. And another major question which we all of us have is we are treating so many of Sjogren's patients. Does our treatment do prevent a lymphoma in such patients? So was NHL a presenting feature? No. Going back to the history, uh, almost like five years back, the patient had a uh, purpuric lesions in both lower limbs. It was not treated by us. It was treated by dermatologists as well as is the usual rule. See, when we sit in a medical college hospital, it's different. But when we sit in a private practice, most of the purpuric lesions are treated by dermatologists. They might not even refer to us till it resolves with steroids. So, red raised mildly purpuric lesion and he remembers extending it up to the thigh bilateral and he remembers taking a steroid for three months and then he was not evaluated during that time. It responded pretty well. Um, this was one of the pictures we had which we actually showed it to him whether it just did look like this and he did not remember uh, doing any major investigations. Based on the history and skin lesions, probably we think in terms of a leukocytoplastic vasculitis. So any small visual vasculitis demands work for an autoimmune, vas uh, autoimmune diseases. Like we sit in a private institution, whenever there is a purpura, we do go ahead with a skin biopsy, LCV. Apart from ruling out a common causes like drugs or infections, we also have to do ANA, ANCA and complements if possible. So these and along with the routine uh, blood investigations like a complete blood count and a urine routine. So LCV as a presenting feature of Sjogren's is much known to us and most of this LCV when they present as Sjogren's, uh, the complement levels are low. Usually it is associated with hypocomplementemia and anti rho antibodies. Uh, see these patients, this patient had it when we diagnosed it as Sjogren's. So we were not aware of the LCV status when it happened. Two years back during the initial wave of COVID, he developed a foot drop. So again right leg followed by a left leg, treated by neurologist again outside. Uh, it was treated with pulse steroids, foot drops, lead, electrical nerve stimulation, patient did improve it. And the investigations done that time was available with the patient. So the ANA was done during that time but of course by ELISA and it was negative, ANCA was negative, NCS showed by peroneal neuropathy, motor and sensory component. So this was a patient who initially had a leukocytoplastic vasculitis when he wasn't diagnosed with a Sjogren's that time. Then he had a mononeurotis multiplex. 
So, but during mononeuritis multiplex, adequate investigation is better as such. But even then, it was not able to. I mean, he was not able to be diagnosed as an autoimmune disease presenting with M and mononeuritis multiplex, and he had now presented to us with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. That is when he was diagnosed as a primary Sjogren's syndrome. So, why was the delay in diagnosis here? Is there is absolutely no characteristic features in the di uh, in the diagnosis of lupus. I mean, in the diagnosis of primary Sjogren's, we have this mala rash with lupus. So people elsewhere, every department when they see the Malarash, they refer to us. There is no significant clinical feature for the diagnosis of primary Sjogren's. So we need an invasive, invasive investigation even for the diagnosis. In the low ANA positivity, out of most of the rheumatological diseases, Sjogren's has got a tendency to have a very low ANA positivity. Lack of a sick eye in Indians and uh, quality interdepartmental transfers is needed even for the diagnosis of primary Sjogren's and the uniqueness of anti -SSA. So ANA was negative, it, of course LSA does give false positive negative results, Sjogren's has only 70% ANA positivity and anti-SSA, even if we do it by our ANA, IF, by our HEP2 cells, it has an inadequate expression. So LSA for anti uh, antilla or a line immunoassay is many times sensitive when your suspicion for Sjogren's is slightly higher. So we have done the study where in India, Sikka is not the presenting feature. Uh, two of the major studies came from South India, one is from CNC Bellur and other when I did my post-graduation, this was my thesis topic. So in this set, only 8% presented to us with direct Sika symptoms. But in when you compare it with Western literature, it is usually 60 to 70% they come with Sika symptoms. But the presenting feature in our patients is only 8% uh, patients had Sika. I did my study on extraglandular manifestations which showed 40% had no Sika at all. So we cannot depend on Sika as a symptom when we approach a Sjogren's syndrome in our part of centers. And another major clinical clue for Sjogren's in Indian patients, you can even try this in your clinic, is the uh, dental caries. Like similar dental caries which the patient, even this patient did not I mean, complain of a Sika. But this patient had a Sjogren's syndrome. So the central dental caries can many times be associated with uh, uh, Sjogren's. So again, this is a patient who is a male Sjogren's. Is male Sjogren's any time different from a female? There have been study from a Korea saying that it could still be different. In a case that many of the, there is lower incidence of Sika in male Sjogren's. Along with that, when a male develops Sjogren's, the chances of having a lymphoma and lung disease is slightly more with them when compared to a female having a Sjogren's. And predict our score of lymphoma. In this patient, the lymphoma has already happened. But when we see the Sjogren's syndrome for the first time, we take this predictor source whether there is a persistent salivary gland enlargement, is there an lymphadenopathy association, Raynaud's association, presence of both anti rho and anti la, RF positivity, monoclonal component, and low C4. So there are seven predictor scores universally accepted. If the, all the seven predictor scores are present in a patient, the chances of going ahead with a lymphoma is almost 100%. But if this is less than or equal to 2 of the predictor scores, the look, there is a very low probability, close to only 4% when the patient goes for a Sika. Is the arthritis here paraneoplastic? I would say yes, because out of almost all the lymphomas, DLBCL, which is the diffuse large cell uh, lymphoma, large B cell lymphoma, has got the highest tendency to have arthritis as a paraneoplastic presentation. This patient also had this onset almost similar to what the glandular management happened here. 3 months since the parotid gland enlarged, 2 months since the arthritis was there. So this is an abrupt onset. So when you come into autoimmunity and lympho lymphoma genesis in primary Sjogren's, it is the autoreactive B cell from the ectopic germinal, germinal center which goes into the marginal zones activated by the BAF along with other cytokines. They go in for oligoclonal monoreactive B cell proliferation which has a lymphomatous escape. But this is this could be prevented. So we treat it with rituximab or we treat it with belimumab in the initial Sjogren's. Does it prevent lymphoma? Uh, as such, before saying no, I should say there has not been many data regarding this. Even the tears in the practice which has talked about uh, uh, rituximab in uh, Sjogren's has not concentrated on lymphoma prevention. So once we have this biological therapy, we follow these patients who are on biological therapy for a long term, prove that this patient did not develop a lymphoma and ideally this patient who had an NHL also, where we, we, we treated with rituximab chop, or chop. All Sjogren's patients who developed lymphoma, of 
because rituximab is given the primary treatment in lymphoma currently, has to be, uh, rituximab has to be used. So unmet needs of Sjogren's syndrome are far too many and this is one of the major unmet need lymphoma in Sjogren's. So the taking points, Sjogren's syndrome necessarily does not be, uh, present with Sika in our state of population. Male Sjogren's has separate characteristics. Predictors of lymphoma when you first diagnose the Sjogren's syndrome is important. When in doubt, when you have an issue, always go ahead with the biopsy. Thank you, Monina. Kavita, a male patient presenting with Jogren but progressed to lymphoma. Uh, people with uh, Jogren are five times more at risk of developing lymphoma than people who do not have Jogren. And uh, the prevalence is about 2.7 to 9.8 percent of patients with Jogren syndrome develop lymphoma. In an European study, 4.3 percent of patients who had Jogren syndrome developed lymphoma over a mean period of 7.5 years and the risk increases by 2.2 percent per year of age. So as the year, I mean as the age advances, the risk of lymphoma also increases. Here we had a male patient 54 years who had developed lymphoma and of course the diagnosis was delayed by over 5 years. And uh, the predictors of lymphoma in a patient with Jogren have been already uh, mentioned by Kavita uh, like clinical features of persistent parotid enlargement, lymph node enlargement, splenomegaly, uh, palpable purpura, vasculitic ulcers, peripheral neuropathy, lung infiltrates, glomerulonephritis are some of the clinical features when they are persistent in a patient with Jogren they should be followed up for lymphoma. The serological markers gain positive rheumatoid factor, anti-rho, anti la antibodies, hypocomplementinemia, uh, cytopenia, CD4 cytopenia and uh, beta 2 microglobulin levels being elevated are all serological markers. Because histopathologically, the minor salivary gland biopsy showing ectopic germinal center is a predictor for lymphoma. Again, microRNAs in the micro salivary gland is a predictor for lymphoma. And the various types of lymphoma that we come across in Jogren are March lymphoma, that is mucosa associated lymphoid tumor. And this is found in extra glandular regions like the mucosa and epithelium associated lesions in the gut, in the skin, the lungs. And uh, the other one is the nodal marginal zone lymphoma. And the third variety is the diffuse beta, large beta cell, B cell lymphoma as seen in our patient. And uh, here in this patient, though he had uh, presented earlier with uh, lymphocytic vasculitis, he was not evaluated. So any patient, as Kavita has stressed, patient presenting with palpable purpura, should be evaluated for connective tissue disease and vasculitis. Even I had a patient uh, a week ago, a young male presenting with palpable purpura and bilateral knee arthritis. Though I thought he could be an HSP, his uh, serological marker, he had a positive ANA, positive low, rho and LA antibodies and there was no Sikka syndrome. Another factor which she says is that there is absence of Sikka syndrome in our patients. And even when there is no Sika symptoms, these people have to be evaluated. The use of uh, ANA by ELISA, that is misleading. So even in the second time when he had polyneuropathy, he was missed, the diagnosis was missed because uh, an ANA by immunofluorescence and immunoblot would have confirmed the diagnosis. And finally, when he lands up with parotid, persistent parotid enlargement and arthritis, a biopsy of the minor salivary glands proved him to be a case of Jogren along with the serological markers. And the arthritis that he had, whether it is a paraneoplastic arthritis, as she mentioned, the arthritis had occurred along with the lymphoma and it was abrupt in onset. But the only thing, a paraneoplastic arthritis, the pattern is little different. It is asymmetrical, predominantly involving the lower limb, but sparing the wrist joint, small joints of the hand. But here this patient had a symmetrical polyarthritis 
resembling rheumatoid. So whether this is a paraneoplastic or it could be a part of Jogren, whatever it is, maybe a radiological evaluation for presence of erosion, for synovial thickening would have confirmed it. Again, a positive rheumatoid factor here may be a part of Jogren. Usually in paraneoplastic, rheumatoid factor is absent. Whereas in Jogren's patients, rheumatoid factor can be present in about 50% of the individuals. So, again, as she said, the take home message is follow them up when they have predictive factors. They have to be followed up for lymphoma. A biopsy will confirm even in the absence of Sika syndrome. As she said, an oral examination, oral cavity examination, loss of dentition, bad oral hygiene, dental caries, all are markers of Jogren syndrome. Even they may not complain of dry eyes, but they have this photophobia, not able to focus on light. That is again a marker for Sika syndrome. So we should always follow up these patients and the biopsy will help in confirming the diagnosis. Now whether treating them early would have prevented development of lymphoma is a question. But there are reports saying that early immunomodulation in a patient with Jogren might prevent the development of lymphoma. And the treatment has been addressed that giving rituximab as a treatment would help in controlling the lymphoma. Thank you. Controversies and consensus. For this, I'd like to call upon the dias Dr. Shamashi Das from Kolkata. <coughs> And Dr. P.S. Arul Rajamurugan from Chennai. Dr. Shah. Dr. Das is a consultant rheumatologist, Institute of Neurosciences, Kolkata. immunosuppression in Schroeder syndrome. Uh, I will be presenting controversies part and uh, Dr. Uh, Arul Rajamurugan will be presenting the consensus part of the same. In this presentation, uh, the term immunosuppression uh, will be both immunosuppressive and immunomodulatory drugs. As Schroeder syndrome is an autoimmune disease, we understand that to treat uh, Sjogren's syndrome patients, uh, uh, we have to uh, give immunosuppressive or, immuno or immunomodulatory drugs. But the controversies arise because there is paucity of good quality, good quality uh, data which support use of immunosuppressive agents in Sjogren patients. And to complicate the situation, whatever RCTs we have uh, available, those fail to meet the primary endpoint. Uh, of the studies. That means they fail to show effic efficacy of immunosuppressive agents in Sjogren patients. Though uh, Sjogren syndrome uh, is mainly a disease of dryness of eyes and mouth, uh, a variety of systemic manifestations, uh, so called extra glandular manifestations, occur in 15 to 90 percent of patients according to various studies. Before we start immunosuppressive agents, we have to first assess the disease activity and patient reported outcome. For that purpose, Euler Sjogren syndrome disease activity index or ESS DAI and Euler Sjogren syndrome patient reported index or ESS PRI are used. So, what is the cutoff when we should uh, use systemic immunosuppressive or, or immunomodulatory drugs? If ESS DAI is 5 or more, <coughs> that means at least a moderate disease activity is present, then we will consider use of systemic immunosuppressive drugs or if ESS prime is high or more, then also we have to consider using systemic immunosuppressives. First controversy is whether we should use topical immunosuppressive for refractory or severe ocular dryness. It is quite frequently used to treat severe ocular dryness in sovereign patients. Uh, uh, including 
glucocorticoid eye, eye drops, cyclosporine eye drops, and catrolimus eye drops. Ophthalmic preparation of cyclosporine uh, was approved by US FDA to treat dry eye disease based on two RCTs, including patients with keratoconjunctivitis sicca. But there has been no specific RCTs carried out in primary sugar patients. So we do not have very strong evidence to support using topical immunosuppressive in sugar patients. Should we use hydroxychloroquine for ocular sicca? Uh, several open level studies showed hydroxychloroquine improved dry eye symptoms uh, of patients with primary sugar syndrome. Like this study published in 2011 showed improvement of tear breakup time, improvement of corneal frozen stain score, and also decrease in back level in tear fluid have been demonstrated after using hydroxychloroquine in for dry eye syndrome symptoms in sugar patients. Later on, one RCT or double blind RCT was conducted. Uh, in that, uh, that was published in 2016, yeah. and in that study, OSDI, uh, subjective uh, dry eye uh, symptom index, was significantly decreased. However, TR breakup time and Sharma test score did not show any change after 12 weeks of treatment with uh, hydroxychloroquine. However, hydroxychloroquine group tended to show continuous reduction of corneal staining score, although that was not statistically significant. So, this double blind RCT could not show any objective improvement of dry eye with hydroxychloroquine. The limitation of this study was small sample size and short duration of the study. Later on, a system, systematic review and meta analysis was performed, and that showed no significant difference between hydroxychloroquine treated group and control in terms of Sharma test result. However, there was numerical improvement of subjective Sika symptoms and this meta-analysis also demonstrated that hydroxychloroquine could reduce ESR. Uncontrolled studies have reported improvement of joint pain with hydroxychloroquine. However, one pivotal RCT uh, done in France published in 2014 in JAMA failed to demonstrate any improvement of pain and fatigue with hydroxychloroquine after treatment for uh, 24 weeks. However, there was a stati statistical trend uh, at uh, 12, 24 and 48 weeks, though that was not significant. So, hydroxychloroquine trial also failed uh, to show any joint pain or fatigue improvement. This study was criticized because there was insufficient number of patients with active arthritis. What about methotrexate? In open level studies, methotrexate showed improvement of main subjective symptoms, namely uh, Sika symptoms, joint pain. However, no improvement of, of objective parameters of dry eye or dry mouth could be demonstrated. Unfortunately, there is no consensus uh, uh, with metho methotrexate in Sjogren's syndrome patients, and uh, definitely there is no study uh, in patients with active synovitis in Sjogren uh, treated with methotrexate. Now, about use of rituximab in Sjogren, primary Sjogren patients. Initial small RCTs, including 17 patients, showed significant improvement of fatigue and significant improvement of SF36 score. However, when later bigger RCT was performed, like this one, French study performed in 2014, where primary endpoint was improvement of at least 30 mm of hash. In, in the domains of global disease, pain, fatigue, and dryness, showed no significant difference between groups in primary and point. However, fatigue improved rapidly. The limitation of this study was low disease activity at baseline and a primary outcome that was actually insensitive to detect clinically important changes. So, this study was also criticized. Another RCT and that is not only an RCT, that was also a cost effectiveness analysis. And that, that was performed in UK and published in 2017. That showed no significant improvement in any outcome measures except unstimulated salivary flow. And also, the cost for etuximab was five times more than that of the placebo. So, conclusion was etuximab is neither clinically nor cost effective in primary sugar <coughs> syndrome patients. However, these two RCTs were criticized because those RCTs were not primarily designed to 
see the systemic uh, effect of the drug in sobriety patients. And there was no uh, severe organ involvement in these two studies. Uh, the data from Reduxner registry showed efficacy of Reduxner in systemic manifestation of primary sobriety syndrome. In this retrospective analysis from Reduxner registry, 70 patients uh, who, had, who had a median follow-up period of 34 months were analyzed and median ESS the improved from 11 to 7.5 which was very much significant. And the overall epic efficacy according to treating physician was 60 percent. So uh, this study was quite encouraging though it was a retrospective analysis. So what about the immunosuppression in renal tubular acidosis? Distal RTA in Sjogren occurs due to chronic tubular interstitial nephritis which is the most common renal manifestation in Sjogren and few cases progress to end stage renal disease. Alkali therapy and potassium supplementation are the mainstay of treatment. So when do we need immunosuppression for these patients? There, is, uh, there are few data which can help us to, uh, uh, to decide when to start immunosuppressive in these patients of Sjogren with RTA. Now immunosuppressive is severe organ involvement in Sjogren patients. If patients have severe organ involvement like vasculitis neuropathy, uh, cryoglobulinemia with <coughs> vasculitis or interstitial lung disease, addition of immunosuppressive agent is justified. However, that is based on low level evidence only since uh, supported by small uncontrolled studies and there is uh, again lack of head to head studies which uh, can compare uh, various immunosuppressive use in Sjogren patients and so we cannot say which immunosuppressive uh, is better than the others uh, in, uh, in which condition in which organ involvement of Sjogren patients. And there is again no consensus on, on glucocorticoid free regimens of immunosuppressives. So to summarize the controversies, should we use immunosuppressive eye drops in refractory or severe dry eye, hydroxychloroquine. Can, can we use for Sika pain and fatigue because RCTs fail to show any improvement <coughs> objectively? Methotrexate, can we use for Sika pain, uh, joint pain uh, because no uh, control study is available in Ituxina? When shall we use Ituxina in, 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 in uh, Shogun patients because two RCTs fail to show any objective improvement? Uh, Right. So shall we do immunosuppression in RTA patients and in severe organ involvement which, which immunosuppressive is the best in which situation or in which organ involvement that those remains the domains of controversies and <coughs> the consensus part will be dealt by Dr. Arun Rajan. Sir. Good morning, Mr. Chief Justice and other colleagues. So I am a substitute speaker today. The slides are prepared by Dr. Kemasas. In health, the most controversial aspects have been discussed by Dr. Kemasas. It's very tough to treat Sjogren syndrome. Most of you know that in the absence of randomized controlled trials. We don't have any clear-cut guidelines. It's very difficult to treat, uh, especially Sika symptoms in practice also. About the topical immunosuppressive eye drops, one uh, systematic review using cyclosporine A formulation on a dry eye syndrome. They are proved to be safe for the treatment of dry eye disease and uh, symptoms improved in 100% in uh, RCTs and tear function improved in 72 percent. Ocular surface damage was ameliorated in 53 percent. So this is a reasonable alternative to tear substitutes and along with it can be used along with the tear substitutes. So ophthalmologists may consider the use of ocular cyclosporine drops in patients with uh, refractory or severe ocular dryness requiring repeated courses of glucocorticoid tear drops. What's the cons consensus and the ULAR recommends 
For non severe like recommended way to seek a artificial tears plus ointments. And ointments are better used at night and the drops are used uh, in the daytime. So starting from twice daily to you increase the dose to hourly depending upon the severity. Then topical steroids, they do not respond. You can try topical cyclosporine A and uh, serum eye drops. Then oral muscarinic agonists. Then about hydroxychloroquine, to consider the use of uh, hydroxychloroquine in some patients with the frequent episodes of particular pain. Because there is a positive trend in the pivotal RCT, uh, lack of reported cases of retinal toxicity or severe adverse events, we are comfortable with hydroxychloroquine and uh, with our uh, experience, we can try hydroxychloroquine in patients with the musculoskeletal symptoms, especially when they have joint involvement less than 4, uh, less than 5, and uh, if it is more than 5, you can even try oral uh, immunosuppressives like methotrexate. Uh, finally, rituximab, that's a rescue drug. So coming up after the invention of uh, rituximab, we are little more comfortable in managing many extra articular manifestations rather uh, than articular manifestations of Sjogren's syndrome. Then about the methotrexate in Sjogren's syndrome, not advocated for Sika symptoms, may be given for articular and extra articular manifestations as a steroid sparing agent based on case-to-case -case, uh, evaluation and the safety profile. It's frequently used by rheumatologists for arthritis in Sjogren's syndrome, if not controlled by hydroxychloroquine alone. Then about the rituximab in uh, Sjogren's syndrome, there are many small studies which uh, have tried up to 400 to 1000 patients totally. So we have uh, enough data now for uh, rituximab use in uh, extra-articular manifestation in Sjogren's syndrome. A recent meta-analysis showed no significant differences in comparison with placebo for both pain and fatigue. So uh, found that intermediate value points in the French study. So no significant placebo difference in quality adjusted life here. A five-fold greater economic cost and currently reserved for severe systemic manifestation. So all severe systemic manifestations like uh, vasculitic neuropathy and ILD and demyelinating illnesses, we can try rituximab. Then in uh, renal tubular acidosis, if the tubular interstitial nephritis is severe and active, interstitial fibrosis is mild to moderate with uh, significant interstitial inflammation tubulitis, reasonable to start steroids. And stabilization or improvement in kidney function has been reported anecdotally. As a steroid sparing agents, we can use azathioprine, mycophenolate, or rituximab, even that's advocated now. Coming to the take home message, assessing HDI and H3, the cornerstone to desire on immunosuppression. And refractive dry eyes, uh, cyclosporin uh, can be used. And for arthralgia and arthritis, you can try hydroxychloroquine. And methotrexate, if they don't, do not uh, get control with uh, hydroxychloroquine. Rituximab currently reserved for severe systemic manifestations only. Immunosuppression in renal tubular acidosis, renal biopsy needed to assess tubular interstitial inflammation. Then severe organ involvement, virtually no control data. Empirical immunosuppression with uh, judicious monitoring is the, as far as the available uh, data today. So these are the messages we can uh, take home. We now move on to a keynote lecture, Mitochondrial Dysfunction in Sjogren's Syndrome. For this, I'd like to invite upon the dais Dr. B.G. Kurian. Uh, Dr. B.G. Kurian is not here, so we'll have a recording for me. Sjogren's syndrome is a chronic autoimmune disorder 
characterized by the presence of anti-row, anti-law, salivary and lacrimal gland dysfunction and pathology. We found increased oxidative damage in Sjogren's syndrome. We found increased 4-hydroxy-2 nominal modified proteins in Sjogren's syndrome serum, vitalizer, and immunoblotting. Since we found oxidative modification in Sjogren's syndrome, we hypothesized that mitochondrial dysfunction also occurs in Sjogren's syndrome. This is a schematic of a mitochondrion. Uh, we can see the mitochondrial outer membrane, the inner membrane, the matrix, and the intermembrane space, and also the proteins of the electron transport chain on the inner mitochondrial membrane. Electron transport chain consists of a series of proteins embedded in the inner mitochondrial membrane. They are called electron transport, this chain is, this is called electron transport chain because these proteins transport electrons. NADH, the electron carrier formed by the Krebs cycle, first transfers these electrons to complex one and gets oxidized to NAD. As the electrons move through this complex, energy is released. And the energy is used to pump protons from the matrix to the intermembrane space. The electrons are then transported by a ubiquinone to complex 3. As it moves, it collects electrons derived from the oxidation of FADH to FAD. The electrons are tran uh, transferred by ubiquinone to complex 3. Uh, more protons are pumped from matrix to the intermembrane space using the electron energy obtained here. The electrons are then transported by cytochrome C to complex 4. The electrons have to go somewhere. Oxygen serves as the ultimate electron acceptor, and this is the reason we have to breathe. Oxygen accepts the electrons and gets reduced to water. The electron energy derived here is used to pump more protons to the intermembrane space, leading to the high concentration of uh, hydrogen ion concentration compared to the matrix. So this leads to the formation of a proton motor force that powers the formation of ATP through ATP synthase. For this, the protons move through a channel in ATP synthase, and as the protons move through the ATP synthase, uh, it turns the protein. As the protein turns, uh, the catalytic subunit of the ATP synthase catalyzes the conversion of ADP and inorganic phosphate to ATP. The process of uh, oxidation and phosphorylation is coupled and hence uh, it's called oxidative phosphorylation. This is also called respiratory chain because oxygen consumption is involved. This slide shows the inhibitors and uncouplers of electron transport chain. Rotenone is an inhibitor of complex 1 and inhibits the transfer of, uh, inhibits oxidation of NADH to NAD. There's no electrons going to complex 1, there's no pumping of protons from the uh, matrix of intermembrane space. So there's an uh, increase in NADH by NAD ratio, there's a decrease in oxygen consumption, there's a decrease in ATP formation. Antamycin is an inhibitor of complex 3. It prevents the flow of electrons from complex 1 and complex 2 to complex 3. Thus, there's no trans uh, pumping of protons to, uh, uh, to the intermembrane space. Uh, cyanide, sodium azide, and carbon monoxide are inhibitors of complex 1, uh, 4. Oligomycin inhibits uh, ATP synthase. It prevents the flow of uh, protons through the ATP synthase, and therefore there will be increase in ATP. However, there will, uh, there will not be synthesis or decrease synthesis of ATP. The there will be an increased amount of ADP. This ADP will go into the uh, TCA cycle, as we can see later. Um, uncouplers uncouple the process of oxidation from uh, phosphorylation. The uncouplers work by making, they create a pore in the inner mitochondrial membrane. 
and uh, the protons freely move from the intermembrane space to the matrix through the this pore and uh, will not and there will decrease uh, uh, amount of uh, hydrogen ions moving through ATP synthase so there will decrease ATP synthase as the protons move through this pore it also pore, it also generates heat the increased ATP uh, uh, found here will go to the Krebs cycle and will keep the isotope dehydrogenase enzyme active and makes more NADH and more FADH2. So the, um, more electrons will be pumped through complex one and, it, um, and it, electron transport chain um, acts, uh, will be working really hard, will be working uh, very fast and it will be very active. Uh, so, the, uh, but there will be less ATP formed. The uncouplers can be chemical, like FCCP is, one, uh, is a chemical uncoupler, and thermogenin is a physiological uncoupler. It's found in brown adipose tissue. It uh, generates heat uh, through this process. So, uh, the electron transport chain, the function of each of these complexes and the function of these inhibitors can be studied really well with the use of the Seahorse extracellular flux analyzer. This machine allows a continuous direct quantification of mitochondrial respiration and glycolysis of living cells. This machine uses a sensor cartridge in a 24 well plate format. This is a sensor. This is a sensor in the cartridge. So each sensor has four wells on top of it and where you can um, add specific inhibitors and the machine will in, uh, inject the inhibitors in a sequential manner as, a, as it proceeds. So uh, this is the sensor and uh, this is the cell layer attached to the plate and there are two embedded fluorophores, one quenched by oxygen and the other sensitive to pH changes. For the measurements, the sensor cartridge is lowered 200 micrometer above the cell monolayer and it forms a micro chamber about 2 microliter. The instrument has optic, optic bundles, of fiber optic bundles that emit light and excites the fluorophores and that measures the change in the fluorophore, fluorophore emission. For this study, we used 18 Sjogren syndrome subjects and 8 control subjects. We measured the lipid profile, glucose levels, we calculated the BMI of these subjects. The patients in the controls filled out fatigue questionnaire uh, at the Oklahoma Shared Clinical and Translation Resources Facility. The study was approved by our institution, institute's IRB. We use T cells for this uh, for this assay. We the unlabeled T cells was isolated using the Miltony Biotech B and T cell isolation kit from PBMCs isolated by density gradient centrifugation from whole blood. The C horse requires the use of adherent cells. Uh, since the T cells are not adherent, we use a cell pack. Uh, to stick the T cells to the wells of the seahorse as it lays. Cell pack is a polyphenolic protein extracted from marine muscles. Um, the related proteins form a key part of the glue secreted by the muscle to attach to solid surfaces. This is useful for attaching non adherent cells to as it lays. The cell pack was coated on wells of plate according to the manufacturer's instructions. T cells were added to the wells and incubated to make them stick to the cell pack. We used 1 million cells per well for the experiment. This is the typical schematic of the result obtained use, uh, uh, for the mitochondrial respiration measured by the seahorse. The machine measures the basal uh, respiration, three readings, then injected oleomycin, then after three readings, injects, it, injects FCCP and measures the maximal respiration and for three readings and then the machine injects um, antimycin and brings down the whole um, respiration, respiration process. This slide shows the basal respiration in the T cells of uh, Sjogren's syndrome and control subjects. The values are expressed, expressed as mean 
plus or minus, means plus or minus standard error. And we've seen that uh, the basal respiration, which is the mitochondrial function under normal physiological conditions, is significantly decreased in the Sjogren syndrome subjects compared to the controls. This slide shows the non-mitochondrial respiration of the T-cells or Sjogren syndrome subjects compared to the controls, while there's a slight decrease in the non-mitochondrial respiration, which is attributed to the inefficient mitochondrial electron transport, uh, the difference between the Sjogren syndrome and the control is not significant. This slide shows the ATP linked respiration, which is the difference between the basal respiration and the proton leak. It represents the proportion of basal respiration linked to energy production. It can be seen that the uh, ATP linked respiration is significantly lower in the Sjogren subjects compared to control. This slide shows the maximum respiration, which is measured after uncoupling with FCCP to measure maximum phosphorylation capability of electron transport chain. Uh, the, the maximum respiration of cells derived from Sjogren syndrome and compared to control subjects. It can be seen that maxi maximum respiration was significantly lower in the Sjogren syndrome subjects compared to control. This slide shows the reserve capacity of the uh, T cells in the T cells of Sjogren syndrome subjects compared to control T cells. The reserve capacity is the difference between maximal and basal respiration, and it represents the ability of the cell to increase ATP production uh, in response to stress. It can be seen that the reserve capacity is significantly decreased in the uh, T cells of Sjogren syndrome subjects compared to the control subjects. However, we did not find any significant, any, different, any significant difference in the glycolysis rate between controls and Sjogren's syndrome. This slide shows the basal uh, rate, extracellular identification rate with Sjogren's syndrome su uh, subjects and controls. While there's a slight decrease in the Sjogren's syndrome subjects, the difference is not significant. Likewise, there was no significant difference in the stress rate between Sjogren's syndrome subjects and the control subjects. Then we looked at the average age of the subjects we studied. There was a slight decrease in the average age of the controls compared to the Sjogren's syndrome subjects, but the difference was not significant. But this slide shows the individual raw numbers of the basal respiration, non mitochondrial respiration, ADP linked respiration, maximal respiration, reserve capacity compared to age, English age of the patients we studied. It can be seen that there's no clear pattern and the results that we see uh, appears to be solely uh, due to the disease. We, then we just plotted the individual ages, uh, uh, the individual values uh, of basal respiration, non molecular respiration, ATP linked respiration, maximum respiration, reserve capacity against age, and we found this, that there is no clear any uh, pattern, and we think that the vaccine is due to the disease. To summarize this talk, we did not find significant difference in extracellular acidification rate, acidification rate between control and Sjogren subjects. There was no significant difference in non mitochondrial respiration between control and Sjogren syndrome subjects. So our data suggests there's mitochondrial dysfunction in Sjogren syndrome. Our ongoing studies include we are looking at uh, uh, looking at patient characteristics with this LRTA or somebody who has steroid pyuria without increased creatinine. Does anybody have any experience with that? The features are suggestive for glomerular nephritis. It needs biopsy. Another thing is if you suspect overlap syndrome. SLE Sjogren overlap, it needs biopsy. So otherwise, for routine renal tubular acidosis or interstitial nephritis, you don't need uh, renal biopsy. Thank you, sir. Basically, in uh, Sjogren, there is uh, tubular interstitial dysfunction and inflammation is less. When you have a proteinuria, like more than one gram as such, that it can be a surrogate marker. We do not wait till uh, the serum creatinine goes beyond. 
So we out of 20 renal tubular acidosis which we have in our center, all, uh, five of them went for a renal biopsy because of proteinuria and most of them had only tubular interstitial inflammation which was quite significant. Those patients as such as Dr. Das described, they improved well with immunosuppression. Those were the category of patients also for whom we did keep immunosuppression, for others we did not. Now what are the causes of tubular Proteinuria is because of TAN, sir, tubular interstitial nef uh, inflammation and tubular interstitial nephritis. That can also cause proteinuria. How do you that it is not Usually when there is a distal renal tubular acidosis, you do not have a proteinuria. When you have a protein urea, you go ahead with the biopsy. Yeah, exactly. You just uh, globalize You globalize normally. Exactly. What I want to mention is that if you get protein urea, you always suspect that glomerulus is the culprit. Exactly, but again. If glomerulus are normal, protein urea is very much. Tubular interstitial inflammation also causes what such a protein urea. Experience, the most involvement of the injoctrates is the. Uh, uh, distal interstitial nephritis and a clinical infection is due to hypokalemia. Exactly. That is due to the stomach. Uh, the the is very, very. Yeah, you observe those. Those are both. I have one more question. In the case, uh, in the grand one you presented, the patient have recurrent swelling of the pelvis or that is just. That was the first presentation of an uh, increased pelvis. Did you go back and ask whether he had recurrent no, swelling? No, he did not have it. No, he did not have it. Thanks for Just a couple of comments and one question maybe. Uh, one was uh, with an excellent uh, presentation and uh, you mentioned though that you know single parotid swelling and therefore not, uh, uh, it was sort of against Jokins. But often we see a sort of shifting, you know, one side and then the other. Just a comment you can answer later. And uh, the other question, uh, the other thing was whether hyperglobulinemia can be used as a sort of, uh, you know, surrogate for treatment, is there any role for treating a hyperglobulinemia? Any comments of the house? And for Kavita again, sometimes we see bilateral parotid swelling, which is not important when we actually do an ultrasound. So is there any clinical way of uh, distinguishing between an abnormal and a... We often feel I mean, bilaterally swollen parotids, which is a common... Uh, uh, Sort of situation that we Currently, see. ultrasound uh, presentations of such parotid glands are being made, made as mandatory now. So, whenever we have a bilateral parotid glands swelling, so without the cytokinitis, so sarcoid also along with sherbrins, ultrasound picks up them much, much earlier. So, may, maybe we will make it as a practice here on whenever we have a bilateral parotid gland, go ahead with the ultrasound. It is at least non invasive procedure which is made. In sudden increase in the size of the parotids and the new appearance of lymph nodes. All these things make us to suspect the very And hypoglobulinemia, any comments? That is even present in a pure geograin, they have said none, not because of lymphoma or anything. But uh, we do not take it as a surrogate marker as of now. Uh, it, is, it is given good amount of points in uh, his diet per se. Uh, and many of the hyperglobulinemia also have cryoglobulinemia along with that. So in a prognostic feature it might be important but uh, we do not do a serial monitoring and see. Treatment we don't no. use no. And it's also associated with RPA. Exactly. Um, thank you for the session. I had a doubt on whether uh, bilateral patient palsy can occur in our case of Jogren's and because Sarkoda's worker was negative and uh, he, she presented with uh, bilateral patient palsy with parotidomegaly and this uh, antibody worker was strong positive for Jogren's and her uh, shermos and her biopsy was also suggestive of Jogren's with a focus score of more than one. So can that be, are they two independent events or can it be attributed to some vasculitis in Jogren's? If so, any advanced immunosuppression should be given. In Shogun, it's not uh, common to see facial pulse. Unless there is any malignancy associated with this, I don't think Shogun uh, may cause bilateral facial pulse. Uh, thank you. We are out of the time. So we will take this last uh, When our patient develops autoimmune hepatitis in Shogun, is uh, gastro people are uh, 
towards uh, steroids and azoran. But we are comfortable, not comfortable with azoran considering the uh, lymphoma risk. Uh, and I prefer uh, a lymphoma for reduction of most of the things. It all depends, right? Primary biliary necrosis or any autoimmune hepatitis with children can be evaluated with steroids. And immunosuppression of soy azathioprine you give uh, for everything, even for pancreatitis of lupus, aza can be given. But aza per se can cause pancreatitis in many patients. So that is there. But if you are comfortable with using IMF, you can go ahead as such. Okay, but uh, uh, considering lymphoma risk in uh, children, is it safe to use azoron in such patients? Ah, not, uh, see, as of now, uh, none of the uh, drugs has been a predictor for lymphoma risk. So it can be given. Okay. Any drugs as such. Thank you. So, uh, with this, we conclude the session. Uh, we thank all the presenters and audience.